the world's tallest skyscrapers. This is a spectacular bubble indicator. Why? Well, first of all, skyscrapers are never, ever built with 100% equity financing. I've never heard of one. If anyone has, by the way, raise your hand, correct me. I'm happy to be corrected. Um, they're generally built with borrowed money. All right, that's number one. Number two, world's tallest. By the way, anytime I say the word worlds with apostrophe S, I teach my students that should, what should flash in the back of your mind at that point is hubris, hubris, overconfidence, hubris. This time it's different because we've been around long enough. We don't need to be building things that are the world's tallest. That's not rational, right? Think of this building here. This is the Burj Dubai. I'll get into the, some of the buildings. but The Burj Dubai, 163 stories, half a mile into the air. That's not rational, right? That's not rational. Because it takes, I've heard rumors, it takes up to 40 minutes to go from the top floor through several elevator banks and out through a mall to get to the surface of the earth. What do you think the view is like up there? It, it's a desert. <laughs> it's a desert with ocean after it. The view on the 163rd floor, probably the same as the view on the 50th floor. Desert followed by ocean. All right. Skyscrapers are also rarely, if ever, built by their intended tenants. So they're speculative by nature. It's usually a developer who steps into the scene and says, I'm going to build this, and I will therefore go and try to attract tenants. It's rarely someone like Exxon or Royal Dutch Shell, some large company saying, I'm going to build A, the world's tallest tower, B, I'm going to borrow a lot of money to do it, and then C, I'm going to occupy it with all of my staff. Usually it's a developer. It's a build it and they will come phenomenon. Well, so does this indicator work, right? This is the great part about teaching at a place like Yale. None of my students believe anything I say. <laughs> they all think they know better. They all want to sort of challenge me on everything. And so fine, that's good. It's, it makes me better at what I do. Um, and so they say, well, that's great, Professor Ron Shermani, that's wonderful. But does it work? I said, well, yeah, let's go back and look through history. We can start in 1907 with uh, the MetLife building and there's some others, but let's start in 1929. In New York, three towers competed for the world's tallest tower status. You had 40 Wall Street go up, and then shortly thereafter, the Chrysler building went up and erected a spire slightly taller because they wanted to be the world's tallest tower, followed by the Empire State Building, and then we got the Great Depression. 1973 and 74, we had the Sears Tower, or Willis Tower, or whatever it's called, um, go up, and then the uh, World Trade Centers down in New York. You had a decade of stagflation that followed that. 1997, the world's tallest tower in the world was, does anyone here know? The Patronus Towers, exactly. Malaysia, not quite ground zero, but quite close to ground zero of the Asian financial crisis. 1999, the world's tallest tower went up in the center of what would argue, at least in a hardware sense, was uh, the tech boom, right? Taipei 101 started going up. Literally, Taiwan was the center of tech hardware. And so Taipei 101 at 1999. And in uh, 2007, this tower went up, deemed the largest freestanding structure in the world in July of 2007, quite literally within weeks of global equity markets peaking before it was finished. Now, I think that precision is probably not something we should seek. That was probably coincidental. But nonetheless, this is a good indicator. A little preview of where I'm going with this. Five of the ten largest towers in the world under construction today are in China.